Welcome to the Attack Action Podcast, where we talk about friendship, fun times, and most importantly, flesh and blood. Here are your hosts, Taylor and Isaac. Hello, Attactioneers. It is I, your host, Taylor, and I'm here with my other host, Isaac. What's up, my friend? <laughs> that's, that's my favorite way you, you bring it in. It is also I, Isaac, the other host. <laughs> well, I think one time we got a YouTube comment or something that they couldn't figure out which one of our very distinct voices was which one of us or something. So I try to always make a point that I say very clearly who I am at the podcast beginning. Totally. Well, we both have like Northern California accents. So to us, they're very distinct. But if totally. you're like an Austrian, you know, maybe, uh, yeah, yeah, who's, you know, studied uh, British English or something, maybe we totally. do sound kind of alike. Yeah. And then it like came in and I was like, whoppa. And then I was like, oh, barrel. And then kush kush, pitted, bro. Oh, like that, Northern California. Totally. Yeah, shred that gnar, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, exactly. Well, thank you everyone for joining us on episode 50 of the podcast. We have a very lovely interview with Yichen and Oliver from the OK and Y podcast slash YouTube channel. Uh, they are Bay Area legends. They're both excellent people as well as excellent content creators. But if you haven't already, go check them out. They have a ton of gameplay videos um, on their YouTube. You know, they release their podcast, um, you know, just uh, making good high level play content out there. So give, give them a look. See, they just released their second episode of This Round's On Me, where they hang out with some guests and taste liquor specifically whiskey. And I think in episode one, well, I know in episode one, it was us, me and Isaac. And then episode two, they have kind of the murderer's row of Bay Area uh, event winners. I think it's a road to national winners. So they all hang out um, and it's a good fun time. So check it out. Yeah. But first, what has happened around the world? Well, uh, you know, a butterfly beats its wings and then that ripple effect <laughs> affects everything. And a dash <laughs> picks up a Talishar. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the calling Singapore happened this past weekend and dash takes it down with a Talishar. It was a pretty incredible top eight and and really fun. Also, big, big shout out to Ethnic Smoke, who top aided the Calling Singapore also on Icelander. My hero. Yep. And an Islander won the battle hard in the next day. So 11-0. Totally. Uh, yeah. Pretty good deck, actually. You know? <laughs> it, totally. I just uh, think it's it's taken a little while for people to... I mean, like, Fi is a bit more straightforward, but... It's just taken a little while for people to understand these brand new heroes. You know, they come with uh, very unique play patterns that you can't just like copy and paste your experience onto. So um, I'm like kind of happy to see that it's taken a little while and I'm happy to see that, you know, we've seen some strong showings. Uh, yeah, especially from Eastlander. Yeah, I think when the meta gets a little bit more narrow, it still feels a little too wide. But that's when these kind of fringier, if that's a word, decks can kind of target the meta like uh, Ice Lexi or an Icelander can do uh, pretty well and be a real contender. So uh, I don't really know what the meta breakdown was at the Battle Hardened or at Singapore, really, um, you know, so that could also be something we're seeing happen with the meta is that it's getting just narrow enough for these decks on the fringe to start coming in and attacking uh, mm -hmm. what is already established. So exciting time. That it is. 
<laughs> we also have the Pro Tour Leal coming up this weekend. Everybody tune in. This I'm really, really excited for this Pro Tour. Much more excited than for the last one. That was weird. Not throwing shade on the last one. But the just open-ended meadow we're sitting in at the moment makes this one very exciting. Um, and despite like road to nat season and all that, uh, it didn't settle that much. I mean, we've seen some some stars, some decks rise to the top, but it like still feels like fairly, fairly broad. So I'm, you know, I'm I'm psyched to see what the best players in the world have to showcase at the highest level here. Yeah, me too. I still was on the fence whether or not I thought the meta was going to remain as kind of vibrant, I think is a great word, as it has been through Road to Nats and even now. Um, but even in Singapore and at the Battle Hard in Portland, shout out to us for doing the commentary on that. Uh, it was fairly diverse and it seems like the meta is kind of probably remain such for at least a few more events we'll see what happens during the national season but that all of that being said i think it's amazing time and i do believe in how wide the meta is or diverse or vibrant or whatever adjective you want to use um, my hot take is that a specialist is going to perform the best that uh, if you are kind of, have been kind of known for a certain hero or something, this is still your time to shine. I thought it would be a little bit more solved by now, but it doesn't look like there is a deck to target. So if you've been practicing for a long time, it's all you now. Yeah, I agree. There's like there's a bit too many decks to get every single matchup like hyper dialed you know what i mean so if you're like testing briar and visceri and phi and Eastlander, you know and bravo and dromai or prism or you know if you're trying to test all these decks to find the best one before heading to an event you know if you're if you're trying to keep your eye on all those decks there's no way that you get every single matchup in this field dialed with each one of those decks to then gauge which one's the best right yeah. so i do think that um, I mean, you know, having a, having a resilient deck with like, a um, a consistent game plan, you know, like this is like a great pick, but then we see, you know, somebody like a very clever player on dash, just taking advantage of these decks that, uh, block poorly and mm. just, you know, using its hyper value, uh, very much on the clock hyper value <laughs> to, uh, really punish them, which yeah. was kind of the coolest part about that result. I thought totally. I couldn't agree with you more. So exciting weekend ahead of us. Exciting time in the game. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. I have a, a kind of, uh, I don't know, PSA. I'm putting the community on blast. I'm not sure wh it, what is appropriate, but now that school has started, I have quite a long commute and there now seems to be not enough flesh and blood content that comes out every single day. Um, so if all the podcasters could uh, kind of double up on episodes every <laughs> week, that, for me, that would be great. Just until Christmas break, you know, and then you yeah. can take some time off. Yeah, totally. <laughs> well, at least until like maybe October, and then that's getting pretty close to basketball season. So I, then I pivot into all my basketball podcasts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're, uh, you're on blast. There has been a, a, a bit of a lack of content, I think, because everybody's like, you know, on the road, hmm. like Singapore, Lille vacationing in France before that, you know, like totally. keeping their tech secret or whatever, you know, there's just been less, uh, less content creation, you know, that I don't fault them for, but looking forward to have it all back. Totally. That indeed. Speaking of content creation. We are content creators and we would love your support. So there are a variety of ways you could support us. Um, liking and subscribing, commenting. Those are all ways you can support us on the platforms that we put out content on. Um, if you're an iTunes user or uh, Apple Podcasts, if you use an Apple product to listen to our podcasts, 
please leave uh, a review, whether it's just stars or if it's written. And same thing on Spotify. I've noticed we've gotten a few more uh, Spotify stars. And uh, I don't know if I want to say shame on you to the one person who didn't give us five stars. So now we're 4.9 stars out of five. (laughs) Or uh, bold choice. Also, if we're, what is that one star? What do we need to do to get that one star back? (laughs) Just let us know. Yeah, no way. Uh, Thank you for the honest review. But if you did give us less than five stars, I mean, I'm serious, you know, I just want to shoot us straight. Totally. But if you did give us less than five stars, let us know. What would you like to see? You know, what do you like? What do you not like? All that stuff. Shoot us a question. Yep. We just love interacting. Exactly. Uh, <clears throat> so like, subscribe, review, comment. That's all great. You could support us on Patreon. Uh, link in the show notes for as little as four dollars gets you access to the discord monthly social hour uh, giveaways we do um, etc our hot takes before anybody else gets to cook an egg on them i don't know i'm really tired it's been a long day at work <laughs> and it's very hot uh you know so patreon's great uh and that money pretty much goes directly to us. And so that's really great. Another way you can support us is to just tell a friend, right? If you're just like, Ugh, I hate commenting on social media, but I got all these cool bros and broettes that I need to tell about the podcast. Go ahead and tell them. That would be great also. And we really appreciate at whatever level you can support us. It's always awesome. Yep. Tell everybody, you know, tell your Tinder dates, just tell your parents, you know, whatever. (laughs) Totally. I told uh, my students about my successful card game playing career and podcast to hopefully I have a particular shy class to hopefully uh, bring them out of their shells a little bit. And it was just crickets afterwards. (laughs) Unimpressed, didn't care, whatever. So, yeah, kids don't care. That's a good maneuver, though. You know, share something about yourself. Put yourself out there. Totally. I'll do the same. I'm sorry I didn't. uh, Wasn't a slam dunk like you're hoping for, but, you know, just keep at just keep at (laughs) them. Thanks, coach. (laughs) Uh, I would like to note before we get into the interview that we recorded this at the beginning of the month and I can't really remember if anything is unrelevant at this time at the end of the month but i still think it's all really solid content um and that sort of thing so uh i hope you all enjoy it isaac do you have anything before we uh, get off into this interview here yeah lastly we yesterday when we're recording this live not for you but whatever on our youtube page is a celebration of our two-year attack action podcast anniversary where Ooh. taylor colin and i um chit chatted chit chatted with the chat um played a couple throwback crucible meta games and uh you know just had a great great time great casual time with uh with us and everybody so go check that out just listen to the discussion fast forward to the games if you you know whatever um but that's up on our youtube page a little a little fun bonus episode Totally. I hope you enjoy that. I still can't believe it's been two years. Uh, it's it's flown by. We're almost to our 52nd episode here and two more to go. So I don't we know have what a that gr- means. We have a great surprise for everybody at our 10-year anniversary. It's going to be big. <laughs> it's going to be big. Yeah, when we're world champions a few times <laughs> over and, you know, James White is basically my roommate by then, you know. All that good stuff. It's going to be hell. Talishar's party. band. <laughs> <laughs> Talishar itself, living legend. <laughs> yeah, because like Genesis, what you need or whatever. <laughs> LL took his Talishar with him or whatever. <laughs> or Captain. <laughs> anyway. Uh, what an incredible, 
incredible game we're about <laughs> to get into. All right. Yeah. Enjoy this episode. Enjoy this interview, excuse me, with OKNY, Oliver and Yichin. And we'll see you in the next one. All right. And we're here with Oliver and Yichin from OKNY Podcast. What's up, Oliver? Hello. <laughs> What's up, Yichin? <laughs> What's up, guys? Uh, uh, yeah, I also have, I guess I'm also going to be as uh, brief as Oliver. How's it going, guys? It's oh, going great. great. Um, we're missing the, I don't know, the the filler to your sandwich, maybe? Kenny yeah. is not here from OK and Y podcast, but we That's got correct. the two of you. Yeah, he's currently playtesting his board game right now. Yeah, so uh, mm. when you when we get to the board game segment, we'll have a lot of recommendation, recommendations, I guess, to to talk about. So nice, excited for that. Well, nice. Yeah, listeners, you better stick around to the very end. There's gonna be some spicy board game talk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, okay, so what's up, my dudes? So you guys are awesome NorCal staples. Oliver, you're most known for probably shuffling your cards really fast and playing Prism. And Yichin, you're most famous for how good of a judge you are. So we're really happy to have both of you on the podcast. So let's start at the beginning. Your flesh and blood birthplace. How did it happen? Take us through the details of all of that. Oliver, how about you start? Yeah. Oh, I start. Okay. Uh, it was so, your it was your idea, so you yeah. can start. Yeah. So we were bored during one one summer, and Ichin was like, "Let's get into a dead card game." And I was like, <laughs> "No," because Ichin wanted to get in like Harry Potter TCG or something. Dude. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, I'll I'll even go further back. So for the last like I want to say like half month, a half year, uh, Oliver and I were kind of like bouncing around in card games because uh, Magic was in a bit of a slump and. Uh, I wanted to try out new card games. Um, I think Oliver got pretty tired of Shadowverse at that point. So we decided to get in on some other random ass card game that we decided would be interesting. So I was like, I was giving him uh, ideas like Harry Potter TCG, some other dead card games like, um, what's it called? Illuminati TCG and it's like some other like random stuff. Yeah, I don't remember. And then Oliver started digging. Well, yeah, I knew about Flesh and Blood because I watched a lot of Rudy stuff only for the box opening videos. So <laughs> that he was uh, my entry into Flesh and Blood. And then he always like talked about Steve Argyle, uh, did Visrai art, and I watched the uh, the ARC, um, his, uh, his premiere about ARC stuff. And I was like, okay, this seems pretty cool. But uh, I didn't really want to get into it because it's a new TCG. Um, but yeah, we were just bored one summer and we're like, okay, let's try something different. Let's find some Flesh and Blood stuff and try it out. So what ended up happening was that I was like, okay, cool, Oliver, I'll do some digging and see if there's any stores around here that sells the product. I did some digging and there was one down in Santa Cruz that's about like, or past Santa Cruz. So it was about like an hour drive from us. And it's this tiny store. I think right now it's actually out of business, which is really unfortunate. Um, But there's this tiny store that sold, uh, that had the Crucible premiere. Uh, And what ended up happening is that we bought a couple of starter decks online. We thought it was cool. And so for the Crucible premiere, because it was just at the height of the pandemic, we decided to just drive down, pick up some boxes and leave. And it was around that time when we started really getting into the game. And I can't remember when we bought our first legendary, but I remember it was I bought the legendaries. Yeah, you bought the legendary. You buy, uh, you buy everything. It was in September. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So it was like right after crew released. Yeah, we decided uh, one one box wasn't enough. We bought two boxes. We bought two boxes. We two boxes was enough, and we decided to go all in. Uh, we our luck was horrible at that point. I think we bought like four to six boxes of Alpha WTR and uh, Arc First Edition, and we got zero legendaries. I think mm-hmm. among them. Yeah. And since then, we've opened pretty much nothing except that, except until like re- until uprising. Yeah. Uprising was our first table, and that's after about like 80 plus boxes. Yeah. So, 
yeah, that's our. <laughs> that was how we got started in the flesh and blood. Uh, we kept opening boxes, hoping to find a legendary, and we got fed up and decided to buy it ourselves. Oh, our Oliver did. Uh, yeah. Well, it wasn't. I I bought it because of our our story where I just kept getting wrecked by your Kasai, so I yeah, needed, I needed to power creep my deck a little bit. Yeah, he was playing Benji, and Benji is bad before Spring Tidings. He's still bad, but you know he's less bad now. Uh, I was playing Kasai because Kasai is great. And hell yeah, I actually don't remember beating him up, uh, but apparently I did. And apparently he got fed up. So he bought himself Mask of Momentum. And he bought me Rayforge Bracers as a consolation prize. And then it spiraled out of control from there. And I started the arms race. Yeah, exactly. You did this. <laughs> yep. That's no that's regrets. Funny. Uh, so wait, so you guys were our best buds for how long? Uh, We've known each other since high school but we, and we went to the same college. Gotcha. Uh, but we yeah. didn't we didn't really start hanging out until after college, I want to yeah. say. Yeah. Uh, after I finished a, a trip of mine in 2017, I moved back here. And it was through our mutual friend, Steve, who we also knew from high school, um, that we started hanging out more and more. Sweet. So you guys are like the uh, Bay Area version of me and Isaac, then, is what you're saying. Yeah, pretty much. But yeah. Buds from high school playing card games in a pandemic. And now... Crucible meta. Start yeah. a podcast. <laughs> now mm -hmm. super accomplished players and successful content creators. Incredible. Well, uh, well I mean... <laughs> successful with quotes. <laughs> accomplished with quotes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, honestly, we don't put a lot of effort into our content. We just... Upload stuff. Yeah. And I'm a terrible player and Oliver is famous for getting seconds. So yeah. No way. I thought Yijin, it was awesome. You guys just put out a like uh uh IRL gameplay video. And uh, I mean Yichin, you did lose, but I didn't think you played terrible in your guys' mm -hmm. uh video. I really actually enjoyed it. It was really fun. Oh, well thank you. I try to make it at least as error free as possible. That's that's my goal for most videos. Just don't forget the tuning trigger, which I do multiple times. Well, you could just I edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I, it's true. I still forget my tunic trigger. I like switch to drum eye for like two days and then switch to back to a tunic deck and just forgot every turn. It's terrible. Yeah, that's I don't know why it's so hard to remember. Yeah. That's why I play Guardian, so that I can it, the, the seismic search is optional. I don't have to remember it every turn. Yeah. I was wondering if that was uh, some spicy, like, Dromai tech that you had figured out, that tectonic plating is better in that matchup over tunic. No. Um, but now we're finding out. It's just so you don't miss the tunic trigger. <laughs> yeah. He also didn't was too lazy to take out the tunic from yes, the other deck. That's also true. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's super cool. Uh, yeah, so me and Isaac actually have like a similar uh, backstory where we definitely like, or I was a, a big catalyst of trying to get us into other like TCGs that are dead or or whatever. Like we played the L5R LCG like pretty briefly um, before getting into Flesh and Blood. And we played like I tried to get Isaac into... Uh, Oh crap! What is that game? Rise of the Phoenix Borns. Oh, Ashes, yeah. Ashes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which I really, really liked, but nobody else really like got hooked on it and that sort of thing. So here we are now at Flesh and Blood, like four TCGs later. You know, I I did think Ashes was pretty good, and I liked it much better than like Transformers or whatever. Oh yeah, I don't know. Transformers was great. I still stand by Transformers. Yeah, <laughs> but anyway. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, but we just didn't have like, I felt like enough time to get into Ashes or I was too busy or something. And then, uh, you know, Flesh and Blood or you, uh, you discovered Flesh and Blood and that was, that was the one. Yeah. I think with, with Ashes, because uh, I have dabbled in Ashes as well, um, the main kind of hurdle for me taking it up was the amount of prior knowledge you needed to sit down and play a game. 
because you start with you know your five cards chosen from your deck right and you just start playing um there's a lot less variance and it's a lot more daunting because you have a lot more tokens and a lot more like random pieces that you have to fiddle with mm -hmm. so a lot of my uh initial hesitation to get into ashes was similar to that where it's like i I want to get into the. I, I really like the idea of the game. I really like the resource mechanic of the game, um, but it's. I don't know. It, it always feels like it, it's a bit of a hurdle. Where flesh and blood, at least, I can just sit down with a deck and begin playing without too much prior knowledge, because I can just read the cards in my hand and go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. It's pretty daunting to uh, get into a game by the whole, where the whole. The whole match is dictated by your like prior knowledge of that matchup. Yeah. Which I guess at least in flesh and blood, um, you know, you can just play for fun at a base level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the appeal for me in ashes was like the kind of cool spell book, um, aspect to it. And that, it was hero centric also, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which is one of the draws of like flesh and blood is the hero centric, uh, part. And I thought it was like really interesting, the resource system, how you like roll dice in you. Yeah. Own. And then you can bank the dice and all that. Yeah, totally. And that's part of like your deck construction. So that was really cool, especially for me coming from, uh, star Wars destiny which had a mm -hmm. dice component. So it was cool to maybe like keep the dice, the dice alive. Yeah. So, um, so what made you guys start a podcast or decide to do content creation or, you know, any of that? Uh, I think that was actually Oliver's idea at first. I just kind of went along for the ride. What about you? Yeah. Uh, so it was you and Kenny that were just talking about flesh and blood design in uh -huh. our group chat. Everyone's uh, like every once in a while. And I was like, Hmm, maybe people would like this because there wasn't at the time there wasn't a lot of content out for flesh and blood it was mainly just um session blood and you guys i believe and arsenal pass i think yeah and arsenal pass and um yeah we originally we were like okay let's do a podcast that's why podcast is in our name but then kenny moved to canberra and his uh work schedule got a lot less flexible so we our planned weekly podcast turn into monthly podcasts, which turn into quarterly podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> so then, um, yeah, whenever we have a topic that we want to talk about, we will eventually get together and then uh, record. But then um, I filled the the downtime between the podcast episodes with just gameplay. And now people like the gameplay enough that it's just our main thing. Yeah, pretty much. Nice. Yeah. Wait, so how does Kenny fit into this? Is he your friend? From yeah. before Flesh and Blood? Uh, actually, so I messaged Kenny because he was selling his gold foil tunic after, that he won from the calling. I was like, mm. hey, how much are you actually selling this for? How much does it actually sell for? Et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, he, he was like, oh, I have no clue. I'm just trying to sell it to get money. And eventually we just like kept talking and we just like hit it off just because we love board games. And we, he introduced me to, uh, to his board game that he was designing. And then we just took it from there yeah which nice. is like clicked yep. so yeah. yeah i'm the third wheel in that relationship so <laughs> <laughs> uh, classic which is why that's why i'm after the ampersand <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of cool really living up to your uh your old him lifestyle <laughs> yeah you could say that i mean so one of the reasons why we kind of continued or why we can, why we continue to do stuff uh, even outside the podcast, because I do like just randomly post articles and stuff. Yeah. And it's mostly because um, both me and Oliver have, I don't want to say we've identified, but it's like we see, we notice that there's a lack of content in a specific area that we'd like to see more of. And it's like, I can either wait around for somebody to do this or we can just do it ourselves. Yeah. Um, and Initially, I think Oliver was a little hesitant to contribute because he's like, I have nothing to contribute. Um, but obviously, he's the most well-known of our of our trio at this point. So uh, clearly, that's wrong. I just contribute gameplay. That's about it. Yeah. But for like game design and stuff, I don't really have a lot to say because it's not really my specialty. 
yeah, I, I can talk hours and hours about, about game design, specifically for Flesh and Blood. But when it comes to gameplay, I'm just thoroughly average. Just okay. I love that you guys make gameplay videos, though. There's like, I mean, there, there are several creators who make gameplay videos, not to take anything away from them. But there's like not enough gameplay videos out there. Because sometimes I don't have time for any of that. But then it, you know, spurts in my life all like, I have time to watch, you mm -hmm. know several games of gameplay videos and there's just like really isn't that many there's also a lot of heroes so uh yeah you know they're they're quite diverse so thanks for doing that yeah, when, keep it up but when we first started i think the main issue is that all the gameplay videos uh not no offense to any of the guys like fabrica or dm armada but they were they were guys who were mostly on the casual side of things mm -hmm. and it was mostly geared for newer players so there wasn't enough like high level gameplay for a lot of the um, advanced players to consume. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 That's what I would say is the niche you are really filling is that you're actually getting like good players and uh, the, the games are, yeah, they're, they're very good. And there's something to uh, Oliver about, you and the way you play the game and your little Oliver isms and stuff that is just like really appealing. I don't know what it is. I don't know how you have so much charisma just on TTS, but <laughs> you're, you're making a hell of a career out of it and I enjoy it. You know, Thank like you. every time you call an Ashwing a friend and stuff or, you know, fuck my hand sucks right <laughs> now, you know, or whatever is just so funny. And maybe it's cause I know you a little bit better that it's even more appealing, but there is uh, a lot of charm in your unedited <laughs> TTS videos, you know, and it's cool yeah. too to see the other uh, great players in California. Like you get John Ho on and Shin and, and Tao Tao and stuff. And so, um, yeah, for a lot of the appealing. a lot of the star power, actually, um, I want to say it was kind of like organic almost so i think the big turning point was the kale match you played remember that uh yeah what so, about it so did you win? uh we went two and two nice i think what 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 happened was like you were playing hasiel right yeah and then kale stepped in because hasiel was losing to you because you're playing prism and he was playing bravo typical matchup right and kale was like uh, prisms are pretty easy. They're pretty easy to deal with uh, as Bravo. And he lost the first game, said, let's go again. I think you guys played a total of four games total. And that video was shared around a decent amount as an example of both high-level Bravo gameplay and high-level Prism gameplay. Was that before or after you won the RTN? I think that was after. Okay. Yeah, definitely after. Yeah, so so that was kind of like our bigger break into the competitive side of things. And after that, um, we got a couple of commenters who would just uh, end up turning out to be like top eight finishers or nationals finishers like Yuki. Yeah. Who are just like, um, you can tell you the Yuki story. That's fun. Oh, yeah. So uh, if you guys watched our videos, I usually play Lightning Lexi. And then I picked up Yuki's list for like one game and I uh, played against one of my friends um, and I I sideboarded poorly. And during the game, I was like, wow, this deck is kind of trash. <laughs> and I, I like, I don't know how to play this. This isn't really working out too well. And then Yuki commented or her, her username says Yuki LB. So we weren't sure if it was actually Yuki or not. But yeah, she was like, oh, that's uh, let's play some games together. And, uh, and then I told her like where to find me and she messaged me on discord and actually turned out to be Yuki. And then, um, yeah, she, she said that she's been a really long time fan because she likes prism and she also likes Lexi and she just been lurking around until she commented on our uh, video about her ice Lexi deck. And then, yeah. And then we started playing and that's, that's uh, how it started. That's why she's a regular guest and why most people mistake her for the why and okay. Why now? Yep. Oh, that's fun. Ha. Get out of here, Yichin. We don't need you anymore. We exactly. Got you. I'm, I'm yesterday's news. Totally. Isaac says that all the time about Yuki's list. Like, trash. 
<laughs> Stupid list. I don't know what she's thinking. You know what do you what do you what are you fishing for here, Taylor? Oh, nothing. I'm just giving you some <laughs> shit. That's all. Yeah, she'll probably comment. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, is that we're just fishing for like likes or whatever for traffic? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. We'll clip that and then uh, it'll go viral. It'll be it'll <laughs> be great. Um, Oliver, I have to come clean. Okay, I've been holding on to this for a long time. I don't know why it popped into my head, but I remember the RTN you won because it was the Sunday of the one I won, and I didn't go to the Channel Fireball uh, event mm -hmm. the next the next day or something. We didn't do the two for or whatever, and I believe that I talked some shit to Isaac like. Pfft, Oliver won because I wasn't there or some shit because I was like pretty excited about my RTN win. And mm -hmm. I would like to apologize publicly to you that I talked that trash. That's fine. And I didn't know that at all. <laughs> <laughs> I know you didn't, but I feel guilty in my heart and just want you to know that I'm apologizing now for it. I, I accept your apology and you are forgiven. Oh, wow. I, nice. I didn't know that it was a thing, but... Uh... It, yeah. It's not a thing. It was just like a thing I said to Isaac probably on our drive home or the next day or something when I was like high on my horse or whatever. Or to his yeah, wife or good. to his dog or something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, to, uh, his like last, like two of your two of your top eight matches were against Bravo. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't that much of an accomplishment. Mm. Uh, but it was the first time that Prism won an RTN, so... Uh, at Ooh, least during nice. that weekend, it was uh, he, Oliver can hold the title of first person to give Prism LL points. Hell yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it was. Uh, I don't think there was, was there a chain in the top eight either or something uh, like that. Nope. There was yeah. Katsu, Dorinthia, a couple of Bravos, and Bolton, and me. Yeah. See, if I had only been there, would have been in yeah. the top eight. Yep. <sighs> Instead, I had to beat Patrick the day before, and he was on Dash. And uh, we reminisced about that match, uh, I think, at the end of PQs or whatever, and talked about like all the tiny tech stuff, like that you we hadn't figured out yet, like load the pistol, have a zero cost attack in Arsenal, so you can kill Urser like really easy. You know, when you go yeah. for the fatigue match, and like those tiny bits of tech against chain had like not been figured out yet at that time and it was just mm -hmm. it was just interesting to reminisce about how far the game has come you know yeah definitely during the first calling i felt like a lot of the players in the first calling are at, at that at that point yeah at vegas were were relatively green to the game so uh not to downplay tyler's achievement which is pretty impressive but i feel like a lot of the chains if we ran that matchup back again now, they would definitely not uh, be. Uh, they would definitely not be uh, losing to uh, Tyler Horsepool's prism. I think it came in like uh, there was like a, a ha there was a lot of division. I think on how the chain deck should have been built or what like the best build was or that sort of thing because mm -hmm. i had played like uh quite a few mirror matches and uh some of them the decks were just like kind of more based on like high rolling super hard you know like i remember some dude like hit two of his three like got in hand or arsenal two of his three fate for scenes in his deck and didn't banish them off the top mm -hmm. and like that was something i was not expecting so he like cleanly blocked some like attacks that were came in for four mm -hmm. and i was like do you run all three and he was like oh yeah it's great i was like okay <laughs> interesting <laughs> and he just like blew me out of the water on like a huge high roll like art of war turn or whatever and um, mm -hmm. so I think that was like part of what, what was going on at Vegas too, is that there wasn't as much maybe centralized information for some reason. Um, 
yeah, or something I think, like that? I, I think the main thing is that like we had we have a lot of figureheads in the community nowadays that we can go to for or people can go to for advice and um get can like are expected to read the meta. Whereas before it was mostly I think Kale and Matt Rogers and a couple other guys from New Zealand yeah. that yeah. were the main points of like talking about the game. Uh, Hayden and ran in too. So there was definitely less information being uh, discussed because most people weren't in those inner circles and weren't like in circles to begin with to talk about that. Yeah, it's a good point. Because I remember, what were we listening to, Isaac? Did Session Blood have some people on? And like, um, uh, oh, who's the guy who's who plays a lot of Ninja over there? Um, everybody Kieran? calls him Belittle or Stubbies. Why am I blanking on his name? I, I don't know. Uh, Jordan Nelson Fussell, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think he was saying on like a Session Blood podcast, like, oh, Chain's easy to beat. Like, you just fatigue him. It's super easy. They can't like deal with it or or whatever. And I remember me and Isaac talking about that episode and we were like, that is has not been our experience you know mm. with with that deck and trying to combat it and stuff so even yep. then maybe the new zealanders were still behind i don't know hot shots fired i guess maybe at new zealanders not <laughs> yeah you're not full of those right sh shots fired so i yeah but we were also kind of in our own little bubble right because yeah, totally um just what i remember of that is like the flock hyrule chain deck yeah is like explosive and very aggressive and can be really good or can kind of brick or so right and then mm -hmm. there's kind of a more consistent chain deck like along the lines of what taylor was running that um can consistently beat fatigue because it's like built that way but maybe it's not quite so i don't know front end powerful or heavy or what you know what i mean like um there's kind of like two ways to go about it like that so um kind of two camps there and you know you would like definitely heard about both but there was like you said not not as much centralized uh information or like testing or whatever so yeah definitely was... nice that was a fun trip down memory lane there back to everyone's favorite meta Monarch. For I the was band. busy playing Azalea. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so for more current serious topics, so w what what's both of y'all's takes on what happens when Prism LLs? So are we going to just have like Guardians reign supreme, or is Dromai kind of the actual answer to that? And then third layer to the question if guardians are quote unquote the best deck is that a good thing or a bad thing go uh uh thinking <laughs> thinking so oh, i got i got it I got okay it. Yeah. uh so after prism lls guardians will uh probably regain a lot of popularity but i feel like icelander also has a lot of legs if prism lls because icelanders uh, one of Icelander's um, really bad matchups is the Illusionist matchup. And Dromai isn't as bad for Icelander as Prism is. And so I feel like once Prism is gone, Icelander will also have um, a lot of, what is it? A lot more success. Yeah, a lot more stay in the meta, I guess. Yeah. He'll be yeah, a lot more popular. Um, will they? Will Guardians be supreme? Probably not, because I feel like Runeblades are still very strong. Um, I feel they can high roll um, Guardians really easily and not be fatigued. Um, as for Dromai with the Guardian uh, Guardian Gatekeeper, I guess, um, I don't feel like Dromai is the Gatekeeper, but I have heard about Dromai's having really good success into Bravo, but I have yet to see it in person or mm. in video or anything. Um, but yeah, that's just my take on it. Yeah, I think there's there's three. I say there's three, four matchups that uh, 
are essentially 90-10 to Prism's favor that are really keeping those heroes down, which are uh, Icelander, Kano, uh, Dorinthy, and Azalea. Uh, Azalea, I don't think, will be that much better in this new meta. Uh, <laughs> like... <laughs> She she's she's definitely more she's definitely better in the meta that she can target the best deck. Uh, I don't want to be like the whole memeing Azalea is terrible or anything. I don't think she's as terrible as everybody thinks she is. Uh, I mean, she's admittedly she's not the greatest. She's pretty bottom tier, but like the bottom tier is a lot closer to the top tier than people assume it is. Um, I want to say that in of those three, uh, Kano, Dorinthia, and Icelander. Uh, Icelander probably has the most potential, but I don't want to discount Dory because I think Dory has pretty solid plans into every hero and can race with the best of them with uh, Glistening Steel Blade. Uh, I would keep an eye on matchups in which Bravo is disfavored to take control of the meta. So Icelander and Dory, I want to say, those are going to be my hot take predictions. I don't expect them to be right, but it would be nice if they are. That's pretty cool. I think I forget who it is who said it. Maybe it was one of the like outcast Haven guys, but they theorized that heroes like Kano and Azalea were maybe a bit more designed to be, uh, for lack of a better term, maybe hunters in the meta Mm -hmm. that if there was like a best deck that they would have the tools to be able to like deal with that but we just really haven't like maybe let the meta evolve that far because the seasons are kind of short Mm -hmm. or you know i mean i guess kano did really well at the pro tour for sure um but that's interesting yeah i feel like azalea especially azalea but also i'll extend this to lexi uh they're in a spot where if they are top tier that means your meta is probably unhealthy Because that means they can laser focus on a single deck and find widespread success. Um, Mm -hmm. Their sideboard plan, especially with Lexi, her sideboard plan is usually pretty tight. So I want to say, like, when you're building your deck as Ranger or as, um, yeah, as Ranger specifically, it's definitely going to be a lot harder in an open field. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Lexi right now is like, pretty tough because you have to flex kind of extreme both ways Mm -hmm. and it makes her significantly worse yeah um the thing about azalea though as much as i love playing that play style and stuff lexi does not suffer from the same like inherent disadvantage that azalea does just in that azalea can generally just fire one arrow per turn Mm -hmm. and doesn't have a weapon Right, so you kind of only want to draw one arrow per turn, but you have to have a dense enough deck that you always see an arrow. So I had a lot of fun with her in like a mid-range meta where you could block with your excess arrows or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in the modern game, that's kind of this like kind of combo-y, ultra-powerful game. It's just like just a deck with no weapon poor defenses and needs to draw like one of these cards per turn is just like inherently i mean like i said i still really enjoy playing it but it's just like it gets it's a bit frustrating to play when you're you know so pigeonholed like that yeah there's compared to looking at a deck like phi you know Mm -hmm. or like or even like viscerai or something that's like a lot more flexible you know yeah, I think it's a it's it's part of the design of it where a lot of these untalented talented heroes are more mid rangey than their talented co- counterparts, mm-hmm. and as a result, um, as the game moves towards having more explosive turns to seal the game, you're gonna have these heroes left in the dust, and it's up to LSS to find ways to make the game more mid rangey, to bring back the crew feeling of hammer for six versus pistol for two two two. Yeah. <laughs> a classic interesting uh that the that like you think dorinthia is gonna rise up i feel like that because guardians 
usually are, you know, typically like fairly slow. Like sure they have like E strike and Rouse and, and Zealous and stuff, but still that's like not that much like go wide that mm. y- you can figure out kind of a combo around their kind of control game plan, or at least it allows you to like come up with something because the game's slow enough that you can um, maybe figure something out with like either deck building or like lines of play or something like that. So I don't, I mean, there's been some um, grumblings about the worry of how the meta will change into just like guardian fatigue if prism leaves. But I just don't think that is like really going to be the case. I actually think it's going to be like really interesting because we'll have to figure out these decks that kind of have this uh, inevitability to them or like a combo or something maybe a bit more exciting than we've seen in the meta uh, to like combat them potentially. Yeah. I mean, people are always uh, worried about the meta. I think right now That's I want to so say <laughs> the meta is in a way better spot than it is um, previously. And the big thing to me is that I'm noticing a lot of matchups where people are really polarized as to if it's a poor matchup or if it's a good matchup or if it's a, just a easy uh, easy win matchup. And that tells me that, one, there's a lot of builds floating around for these and that the meta hasn't really solidified it on any single one, which means either the hero's bad overall or it means that the hero has enough uh, gameplay to them that people can find success on their personal builds. And when people find success on their personal builds, that turns a lot of matchups into skill-based matchups. And, it's, uh, and so that's a, I think that's a good spot for the game to be in. Yeah, totally. That's my favorite part about this meta is that I just hear like, oh, this deck's good or this deck's bad or this hero's like good or, you know, from like top players on both ends of the spectrum. And it's just like, yeah, especially hearing that about new pl- or the new heroes. I'm like, so none of these are really solved yet. And um, mm-hmm. none of the matchups are really solved in the field so wide that there's just like so many different builds with sideboards and like all kinds of stuff. And it's a lot harder nowadays to have every one of your matchups dialed. So it's just really interesting to hear all of the top players like contradicting each other, you know, like this deck is good or, you know, yeah, this is a terrible matchup or anything like that. Um, But I think people are like pretty quick to jump the gun because they'll like, you know, have like one day of testing and they're like, "Uh, you know, Briar sucks now or Briar's broken now or whatever. And you're just like, what? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Are you just venting on Twitter or is this like actual data? But it does make it really interesting. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's it's wild. Like to your point, Yichen, like I've heard from multiple people have said like, oh yeah, Viscera is favored into Prism or Prism is favored into Viscera or Icelanders favored into Phi or Phi's favored into Icelander, you know, and it's like, it's all over the place, you know, maybe not so much like this week or whatever. I don't know. I feel like there's a bit of a, uh, people are hunkering down and testing quite a bit and it's like kind of quiet out there in terms of like what people have to say, you know, so it's a yeah, there's no, there's no local level events. Yeah, there's yeah. no local level events, and we're moving into PT Lil, so everybody's keeping their super secret tech a secret. Yeah. Uh, Oliver, I wanted to ask you about... So I've played the old hem Dromai game quite a few times, and it feels really Dromai-favored. Um, is that... So what's then the difference for Bravo versus Dromai? Because I have not played that. It's the number of poppers. Uh, Bravo just has a higher density of poppers. I have lost to John's old him, where he runs 27 poppers and stays very aggressive with pummels. And that destroyed me every single time. So that's why I added Remembrance to the deck. Um, against Bravo, he can pivot on a whim between being super aggressive and then just going fatigue because he has so many poppers, you're not going to go through all of them with all your dragons. So, mm. um, yeah, just uh, that's what I see from the draw my perspective. 
Um, there are some Dromai lists that are running um, more aggressive redline stuff like Blaze Headlong, Scar for Scars, um, and uh, yeah, all the, all the other aggro stuff. But I feel like that isn't really my play style, so I will probably never gravitate towards that, even if that's the way to beat, bro or beat Guardians. Nice, fair enough. Yeah, I guess so. Cause like, or for old him, like you need some amount of ice cards, and so and a lot of those are like non-attack actions. Yep. So mm-hmm. that cuts into kind of your blue count that you could use as poppers. And then if you like cut those away, you might as well just play uh, Bravo. I tried to do like Sledge of Anvilheim. I thought that was like kind of good tech in old him, but it like did not really work out as much as you want it to because once you kind of get a board state you can't really afford to uh take the damage and then save two cards to be able to swing sledge but i guess every third turn you can with tunic but that's still like not fast might have helped in my game what might have helped in my game to get rid of like uvia and yendere but yeah um yeah that's why i ran it yeah is to get rid of uvia in one hit Mm -hmm. which is nice but Honestly, yeah. Honestly, I think Winter's Whale is enough for most stuff because most of the dragons only have four yeah. life or less. Yeah. Uh, killing Uvia it just requires like a, a six power swing, which um you yeah. not run your deck. Yes, like that's true. A, uh, maybe like a four for six. I think there should be some of those in Guardian. Yeah, or just like a three for seven or something. Three for seven. What kind of rate is that? Or just like a C and C. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. True. Yeah. Hard to have those line up though at the perfect time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh cool awesome so yichin here's a judge specific question okay uh, from from me so slow play so how can players combat this maybe not let issues maybe a strong word but uh kind of hurrying their opponent along when they're on kind of a control build but without being rude uh to hurry them along and then like calling the judge over and that sort of thing yeah so this is a pretty big issue in a lot of games especially magic and fab um and a lot of it stems from an issue where you might be perceived as rude if you're calling a judge over because your opponent's playing slow so most people don't do this until like the last 10 minutes of the round and then they're like uh we actually have to hurry up and by that time You've already lost like 20 something minutes because your opponent's been playing slow. Uh, I see this concern a lot with old him players where they're like, I take 10 seconds of my turn because it's just hammer for four. Um, but my opponent spends like three minutes deciding how to block. And then he realizes, oh, he's getting a frostbite. So he has to th- rethink his turn again. Um, in these cases, the best option, and I think the option that most judges will say is just call a judge and just say, hey, no offense to you. I just want to call a judge to make sure that we want to finish on time. Because nobody wants to draw in this game and everyone wants to finish on time. So hopefully your opponent understands like, okay, that's no problem. We just want to make sure that, you know, the game finishes. Um, there are going to be cases where your opponent might take, may, might take offense to that. And I have heard of cases where your opponent is just feels that he's been slighted some way or will be a little bit more standoffish afterwards. Um, obviously if it gets too bad, you can just say it's, a uh, it's, uh, unsportsmanlike conduct. Um, but as a person in the driver's seat, there's honestly not much you can do other than, uh, just reminding the player every now and then like, Hey, just don't want to, don't want to rush you, but we are on a time limit. So if you can, you know, hurry it up, that'd be great. Or just make sure, you know, you, you think on your turn a little bit faster. That's, that'd be great. Um, and then just. Reminding the player every now and then, like, hey, we have 15 minutes left. Hey, we have 25 minutes left. Just so that they know that you're also looking out to make sure that they don't get a draw. As if, if they can win and if they are, they're confident they can win, they will be like, oh, okay, I just want to finish this game as quickly as possible. Right. So uh, that's great advice. So you are saying call a judge over like as early as possible. Um, maybe even if you don't even remind your your opponent to uh yeah i mean like it's always nice faster. it's always nice to be like hey just don't want just want to let you know play a little faster uh or even when you sit down just like hey um or when you when you start sideboarding like hey uh it looks like this is gonna be a long matchup um just make sure that we were playing on playing playing on time 
Um, I hope you don't mind if I call a judge if, if you're slow playing. I just want to make sure we finish. Um, for the most part, hopefully all your opponents will understand, like, hey, it's it's a high-level tournament setting, and you're expected to finish your games on time. So, yeah, it's yeah. It, it's definitely rough, especially with Icelander, because Icelander requires lots of thought from both players. And so, unlike Ultim, where it's only th- thinking from one player, essentially, so it's, yeah, it's kind of rough. Well, p- part of why so many of my matches went to time uh, at the last RTN that you judged, mm-hmm. Ichin, was that my opponents just had no idea what my cards did yep. or what I was going to do. And so like, I needed to walk them through uh, stuff a lot. Um, and and they had to read cards like several times and that sort of thing. So um, you know that was part of the challenge as well, which is nothing that either player could do to yeah you know yeah sometimes you just gotta gotta expect that at lower level events you're probably gonna go to time um if your opponent's not very familiar with it at that point you're just like okay let's just make sure that this doesn't happen again in the future just explain to him all the lines and just explain to him like what you're trying to do um and rtn it's at that weird um it's at the weird midpoint between competitive and casual that i think gets a lot of players so in terms of judging advice, honestly, slow play is the hardest the hardest call to make for judges because we also tend to err on the side of not giving people penalties for slow play because uh, I can, you know, because it obviously thought take, you know, thinking through lines takes time. My general metric as a judge is if I can figure out two or three lines of play that are, that seem like good plays and I give you a little bit more time after that. I expect you to make that make make the choice because yeah, I, you should be thinking about your turns, um, you know, prior to them happening. Yeah, yeah, I think that this is where, you know, um, this is like a real issue. Is at like RTNs and these, they're technically competitive because you're trying to get a nationals invite or there's something like on the line, but then maybe it's like half casual players um yep. i definitely ran into this like a number of times like early on playing azalea and like people would have to read every card i i drew or mm-hmm. i played you know and um and i would do things like even like with lexi i would like play my second arrow and i would be like okay there's there's like three hit effects or whatever and i would like walk them out you know yeah um just to let them know like or i have in you know you're gonna have to pay one or discard and i you know i have amulet up also Mm -hmm. just to like hurry them through what they're going to (laughs) eventually you know get through anyway but just to like make it quicker and then not have to have them double check and catch stuff i would just like announce it so it's like all very clear and out there and then they could which like honest like if you're trying to shark somebody or get a competitive edge you know, even mm-hmm. like not dishonestly, like you shouldn't have to announce all of that. But I've like definitely found from my perspective, just like that's just better for me in the end, um, you know, to get there. I've also I've like at the beginning of a match, I've said like, um, or, you know, this this might be a long game, like neither of us want to get a draw or like halfway through a match. I've said like, oh, we're we only have half our time left and we're still like above both of our or above 20 life totals, you know, Mm -hmm. and point stuff out like that, like, like with a smile, you know, trying to be like, yeah, it's like friendly, 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 but yeah, but it's like, neither of us want to draw. It's, you know, it's like a double loss. We, you know, um, so just trying to find ways like that to, uh, just to keep it light, you know, because, I feel like for most players, it is like knee jerk kind of offensive or, you know, like nobody wants to be hurried along, Uh, Mm -hmm. but yeah, like it, yeah, it's most frustrating at like roads to nats and stuff because, you know, at at higher level games or most get, you know, like I'll sit down across from an old him player, you know, as Lexi and I'm like, all right, I'm not super dialed in this matchup, but I'll like try to play as fast as I can. You know, yep. and then we both just like understand what's happening. So we have to make quick decisions, even if it might cost me the game. And like, that's 
really what you just hope to run into, but it, I, I definitely understand it can be really frustrating, you know? Yeah. You get and honestly, the there's not much you can do about that. It's like, again, it's, it's finishing games on time. Uh, if one player just is a slow reader or just, you know, is completely unfamiliar with the deck at that point, I think you probably just take the loss. And it can be frustrating if it's especially if it's like early rounds where it's like, oh, I got paired with this guy round one. I want to draw because that's going to be, you know, super, super bad for my breakers. Hmm. But at the same time, it's like there's only so much hurrying you can do. And um, you never want to make the person feel bad for playing slow because that's how you get players dropping out of the game. Hmm. So it's a yeah to the players that want to play fast. I totally, uh, totally understand you. And as judges, we try to make sure that players are playing on time. And, you know, if I walk over and see watch a game, walk and walk back five minutes later and they're still in the same turn or just one turn after, I'll just be, I'll just be like, you guys need to play faster. Um, so it's a group effort. And as one single person, the only thing you need to do is just ask nicely. Yeah. Yeah, that's why it's so, so hard because you like never want to discourage anybody from like playing. You know, yeah, yeah. That's all all great advice for sure, and is something to live with. I did want to ask though, kind of as a follow up, uh, do you both have any thoughts on how draws work in Flesh and Blood? Do you think that system could be uh, changed for the better, or is it is it good as is, and why? What do you think, Oliver? Um, I this is the first competitive TCG that I played, so I have no idea how it's supposed to work, and I just accept it how it is. <laughs> Did you play Hearthstone? <laughs> There's no draws in Hearthstone. It's just, or I guess there are draws, but you just they never happen. Yeah, they rarely happen. Okay. Also, it, that wasn't competitive. That's just casual. Weren't you in a co- college team or something? Nope. They uh, denied me. Oh right, you dropped out of the college team. Okay. No. <laughs> um. So coming from Magic, uh, at a local level, I appreciated the fact that you could intentionally draw because it saved me time as a judge. <laughs> it saved me uh, a lot of effort from like paying attention to, that t- to their table. But from a competitive standpoint, I think that having draws count same as losses feels bad, but it's necessary because there is a general culture around card games where... Players who are used to drawing or conceding out of convenience will continue to do so even at the uh, up to the highest level of gameplay, except like you know top eight of a calling or something. And I can see why LSS would want to crack down on that because it doesn't look good for the game. And if they are interested in having the game become a sport of sorts, it definitely doesn't look good. So right. I am totally okay with them having draws be counted as losses. Uh, honestly, I feel like a draw should be, I don't want to say worse, but there are still cases where you can, both players can draw and then they'll still be in the top placing for, uh, for their, you know, for their uh, win, re- win record in Swiss. I want to say it might be better for competitive integrity to absolutely discourage draws. But at the same time, that also encourages people uh, being more belligerent about slow play on their side. So it's a double-edged sword. I want to say that this is their their current draw method is a good compromise between the two. Uh, but I don't think it should be happening if you want your car, if you want the game to be taken seriously as a competitive competitive game. Yeah, I agree. I think discouraging draws is awesome. Because if a draw is better than a loss, then you're going to have huge numbers of players like trying to win, but then going to the draw. Yep. You know, as the default. And like, that's not the game you want to be playing or I want to be playing. And especially, especially with Flesh and Blood, where you can easily pivot to, I just block with my whole hand per turn and see if you can get over it before the timer runs out. Yeah, that's totally true. Good points there. I really didn't have uh, an answer or a counterpoint for either of those things. I actually just wanted to know your guys' 
opinions mm-hmm. on it. <laughs> so, heck yeah. All right, moving down the list of stuff, unless Isaac, you got something you wanted to say right there. Um, I was just going to ask, um, Oliver, are you going to nationals? Yeah. Nice. Is that the next competitive event? You're not going to Lille, correct? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, yeah, it's going to be the next big competitive event. Yeah. And you uh, go 1-3. One, 1-3. Three. One, three. Well, 0-3 oh, in draft. And then 1. I think I said to play 3CC games first. Yeah. yeah. No way. You're good at draft. Uh, we'll see. I don't really like this draft format. Um, who are who are you looking at competitively um, in this format or this meta or whatever? Um, assuming Prism LLs by the time the BNR rolls around, either Dromai or Icelander. If not, then just Prism. I don't care gotcha. like how unfavored she is against Fi or Viserai. I just like playing her. Take she's the old girl the out for, for one yeah. more spin. <laughs> yeah, she's a. Uh, She's like pretty resilient. I mean, I know that like Briar is bad and stuff and Fi is really bad, I'm sure. But as far as like polarized decks go, um, you see Prism's doing really well despite that anyway, which is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Honestly, when I saw the statistics, I was like, are you sure this is right? This this can't be right. Because I was like, Fi just eats Prism, right? And I asked Oliver, like, is there any Prism build that beats, beats Fi? And he's like, maybe Harold Prism beats it? Which is what most people are playing. And then I look at the winning deck list and it's all just like, oh, it's all just regular prism. I'm just like, mm. this is really confusing to me, but I'll accept it. <laughs> but it's just like, <clears throat> you know, has always been a very powerful deck, you know? It like just always has been, despite it having like pretty bad matchups, because it will just still beat those matchups if the other player doesn't really know what's happening you know yeah what I mean? it's it's a pup stomper it's a pup stomper hero essentially right it's like yeah. Riki and dota where you just have uh where people who are unfamiliar with the matchup just get completely wrecked by it because they don't know to kill genesis or on site so maybe it's that i might be huffing the copium a bit a bit too much on that on that side but uh, that's that's pretty much my only thoughts as to why prism is so successful um which, if it is that, that's a good thing because that means there are a lot of new players picking up the game and playing in Road to Nationals. So, totally so, yeah. fair. Cool. How are you liking the the uh, Ice Witch, Oliver? I think she's really fun. I think she's more fun than Dromai right now, but not as fun as Prism. Um, <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot I need to learn still. After losing to John a bunch of times, I realized. Uh, I'm uh, not as good as that. Good at Icelander as I thought I was. Mm. I just beat Yuki a few times, and you're you're suddenly thinking you're so good. No, <laughs> I just uh, I don't know. I still can't find the right lines, and I I missed Lethal, and I and then I died. <laughs> I think I think no. you play a lot of your last turns a little bit too safe. Yeah, you don't yolo enough. Yeah, I block too much, and then I eventually just die. Hmm. Are you running uh, the pyroglyphic protection against Viscerai? No, I am not running that spice. Not oh, yet. Come on, man. It's so good. Yeah, I imagine it can be really good. But it's I... also hard to time with their more to tight turn. So yeah. if they just don't have it, then it's kind of stuck in your arsenal, right? So Yeah, I've used it just like uh, even if it isn't on like a... If you can... If they are going to make like a few rune chants and swing Rosetta, like it still can for two resources block potentially five damage, you know, which mm-hmm. is like <clears throat> well beyond like rate of how stuff blocks. I will say like after watching some of your Icelander games, like I don't have uh energy potion in my deck, but ha- watching you play with it makes me want to put it in because it makes it a lot easier to like play things like channel or any of your other two cost spells or at like right. the minimum it's a zero for three damage because you can play it and then use it to waning moon right away yeah. so it it can be i think more efficient than i was giving it credit for um and i cut it because it was like that plus blizzard plus ice amulets was like too many things that like didn't block and i didn't want to give up blizzard and ice amulet 
Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I also had ran into the issue where a lot of stuff didn't block. So yeah. I've been changing the deck up a little and trying to figure out what I need. He's used to that, though. So he, he plays Prism. He draws yeah. those three aura hands. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, but sometimes you give up too much in Icelander when you can't block a little bit. It's like pretty hard to claw back out of that hole. Uh, the question is, are you running Ironhide Gloves? That's Oliver's favorite card. Yeah, one of my favorite. Oh, yeah, cards. that's great. Yeah. It's so good in that deck. Yeah. I toyed toyed around with Conduit of Frostburn as well to like turn some of your blue block for twos into block for threes. Uh, sometimes against like the aggro decks. Mm-hmm. And then they like come into like a situation where uh, you still have one resource floating and you have that quell available and they could like attack you at a break point. And sometimes they just like don't. And, uh, you know, either way, it like did its job, even though you don't like use all three of its resources. But, you know, I think that's more of a player's not knowing what the right play is right there at the end of their combat chain more than knowing what the exact way to play that is. So, Mm -hmm. okay, (laughs) makes sense. (laughs) Yeah, uh, this cool. is. He's like, oh, that's nice. I'm just thinking about it. It's hard to think and talk at the same time. <laughs> that's why I don't think during my games. Just play on pure instinct. Boy, yeah. I wish I didn't think during my games. That would <laughs> make things a lot easier for yeah. me. Less I on, yeah. I Sanders honestly the first hero that I've had to think about my turns. You can tell <laughs> he's thinking because it because he'll stop. He'll flick his cards slower as as he like weighs between two options. Yeah. So he's really easy to read where he flicks cards fast when he has a play ready. He flicks cards right. slow when he's deciding between two options. And then he stops flicking when he needs to go into the tank. So you can tell <laughs> you can you can absolutely read him like a like an open book. Yep. Dang, dude. Giving away all of his secrets right before nationals. Yeah, all of his tilts. Well, well it doesn't it matter. That. His opponent's dead anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Kind of optimistic, but We'll see. Uh, go ahead, Isaac. Oh, I don't know. I just, I played two games as Easelander now, and coming from Kano, I was just like, this deck does zero damage. Correct. <laughs> I just stalled them and didn't do anything and hoped yep. I get another card that stalls them again and don't do anything. <laughs> I know it's more than that, but that was my initial like, ugh. Uh, yeah, uh, they do because if, yeah. if you really don't want to do anything, run Kraken, and then your game goes for like <laughs> sixty turns, and uh, nobody wins at the end. You know, <laughs> it's it's just wild. Your games are like two hours long. It's like super effective. I found that like draw draw dragging out the game, but mm-hmm. it's like you, that two damage you lose like makes it impossible to actually win in any reasonable amount of time yep <laughs> well unless you play lightning fast but that's Oliver's true. gotten pretty Oliver's gotten slower ever since he picked up Icelander yep she Ice slows hero. me down not the opponent <laughs> 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 that's that's great uh, cool well we'll have to compare some Icelander notes uh, later or something like that yeah, sure, sure. Um, do you think Dromai can be competitive? Uh, I, I think she can. Um, but I th- feel like she has too many poor matchups, like Ninja, Runeblade, um, and Guardian, that she is not going to be as well off after Prism LLs. But I think she can be competitive. As we saw, like Battle Harden. There's plenty of Dromai that are doing really well at the top tables. So, oh, yeah. yeah. There's something, it's just so inherently powerful that, like, you know, like I think of the dragons are like, it's like your attack actions are under curve, but then they just stay out there and absorb right, yeah. damage for you. And you also have the like Dune Breakers and Ember Maws or like Dune Breaker CNC or whatever for the. You have those like above curve attacks 
for the matchups where you can't always just have your dragons out there to get like hit affected or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. It just feels like you have all of the pieces you block extremely well. Um, You do have to make Ash, which sucks, but that's just like so many powerful components. It just feels like you don't have the sideboard space to like be able to capitalize on all of those, you know, powerful tools. But I think somebody will, you know, figure it out or maybe it'll just take each player like a million reps um to get there but like to find like a balance where you can you can really take advantage of those uh advantages sorry it's late (laughs) yeah it's all good yeah that that, that makes sense uh there are like some people who probably have ice or draw my figured out by now but they're keeping it under wraps for like the upcoming tournaments Mm -hmm. um so Maybe we'll see. We'll have to see what uh, comes up in those tournaments or to her nationals, etc. Yeah, it's very exciting. I could be totally wrong, too, and I'm pretty bad with that deck. I'm just kind of a little bit obsessed. So we'll see how it goes. So do you guys think that we will have three heroes in draft formats moving forward? Do you think that's the new standard? Or will they go back to the four heroes? Will we see one hero? What do you guys think? Uh, honestly, I kind of hope they don't stay with three heroes. Um, I feel like they'll just bounce between three and four, uh, depending on how this how their set is planned. But they do seem to like the three hero format a lot more than the four hero format for some reason. Yeah, I think it's there's a bit more. I don't want to say unpredictability, but there's a bit more push and pull with uh, the four heroes that sometimes you just don't get a good hero pool for that four hero, and you're heavily reliant on the crossover cards to shore up your decks, which makes decks overall a little bit less strong. Uh, I think the average Monarch um, deck is probably slightly worse than the average Uprising deck. And similarly with WTR and Arc, where they're slightly, probably slightly worse than the average uh, Tales or uh, Uprising deck. I feel like that's a, that's a big reason why people might enjoy those formats more. Um, and I can also see the counter argument where the more optimized a deck with 20 life gets, the more it becomes like Blitz, and nobody likes Blitz. <laughs> well, some people like Blitz, I don't want to say that, but a lot, a lot of people don't like Blitz precisely because... Decks are too optimized and you can win within a few turns. Yeah. I think that was Oliver's main complaint about um, Tales of Aria, where it was just like, what was it? You kill your you, Briar and the uh, Lexi matches, they end in like three turns. Yeah. And then Oldham just drags out the whole turn and the whole time. So there's like no good in between. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. isn't that the game now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is. I want to say. I want to say, like, I want to see them experiment more with the draft formats. I want to see a two talent, two class set. I don't think it'll be very popular because it's only going to be two classes, but having two talents and two classes would be a very interesting draft format. And it will probably feel a lot more like a advanced draft format, like in Magic, where you have to uh, pivot and read signals and it's a lot easier to pivot. Yeah. And you can pivot a lot more successfully. Uh, than in flesh and blood draft currently yeah th- that's that's my big critique on uprising especially uh is that we've really lost the ability to pivot like mm-hmm. e- even late in pack one you know you ha- we have less cards and uh the quality of cards is pretty the gap between them is pretty drastic so yeah. If you just aren't seeing them, then there's no reason to pivot. You might as well just kind of stay in your your forced deck lane and that sort of thing. And so <clears throat> it doesn't make for an interesting draft portion of the draft rounds, in my in my opinion. I mean, I yeah. guess it's still kind of interesting, but it's much harder to cooperate with your um your the the people in your pod and then it just makes it like really stressful like you're just trying to hope that you get past the right card so your deck can at least go like two one in the pod yep you know so 
I I feel like four heroes makes it easier to pivot late, you know? Yeah, and that's precisely because there's going to be less cards overall that are that hero only. Yeah. So you can choose, you can stay in the generics a lot easier because there's going to be four generics or more. So it's like you have a lot more time to decide. Yeah. I I personally much prefer the three hero format just because it adds some nuance, not just like everybody's nicely in their lane and each player or each hero is played by two players, you know, or whatever. Mm-hmm. I like that there's some like um, competition and things you have to figure out. Um, I agree with everything you said about uprising the one, and I'm still like, not sure if I like it yet, but the one silver lining I will point out is I feel like in uprising the signals you send are like the most important out of any set I've like drafted so far, which I think is like pretty cool. Again, I'm not like uh, endorsing this set just yet, but um, that's like a pretty interesting thing. I've like come to, understand more like compared to you know aria or Marna, monarch or whatever i think that's pretty cool yep absolutely it's interesting because a lot of the um a lot of the flesh and blood drafts in terms of the actual draft itself it looks a lot like some of the worst magic draft formats and i don't mean that as an insult but like there's a lot of similarities <laughs> between the criticisms of uh draft formats like ixalan and shadow Moor. Where it's like, oh, you just pick a lane and stick with it, and that's that's all your deck is. Um, but that's not really necessarily seen as a deal breaker for a lot of flesh and blood. And I think it's because, um, like with deck building versus gameplay in Classic Constructed, you don't have as much freedom in deck building, but you have a much more, much tighter experience in gameplay that it makes up for the less freedom you have while, while deck building. It's just a weird contrast though, right? Because like Arya had so much nuance or like so many different archetypes, you know, mm-hmm. or like, you know, you could, you could pivot talents. You don't have to pivot whole classes or, you know what I mean? There's like yep. a lot of flexibility there. And then we hit uprising and it's just so rigid, you know? Yeah. And again, the, like I said, the sending signals, there's like definitely positives to it, but it's just like, feels like really starkly in contrast to the i don't know just that to me just that like really beautiful like deck building aspect of aria yeah. um but anyway now i'm just musing <laughs> 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 kind of what this whole episode has been you know um <clears throat> okay so uh, well we have a few more questions i i do want to hear from you guys so I was kind of wondering because I the end of the year feels like it's coming up because even though it's freaking only August and <laughs> in the in, end of August, but like you know the final pro tour is happening, nationals are right around the window, so or right right around the corner. Um, so what do you what do you guys think about the future of Flesh and Blood, or what would you like to see? You know. Um. Less room blade. <laughs> um, and I think I would like to see more tested sets, if that makes sense. Um, some of their cards that they've put out doesn't seem like they've tested it very thoroughly. Uh, so I just would like to see more balance, uh, less bans. Um, I'm not saying stubbies needed to be banned, but I'm I'm just thinking some of the past bands that they had, like Seed of Agony or Duskblade. Um, yeah, if you notice, most of the bands are concentrated around Monarch. So honestly, it's just Monarch that's the issue. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Prism, Prism sucks. Prism, is it Menace? Chains of Menace, et cetera. I think, Seeds, I think Starvo made the, made the game unfun for uh, a number of people. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, but. Uh, for me, uh, I have a whole wish list of things I want to want to see. Um, oh, excellent. Awesome. I'm ready. I want to see. Notes. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, so, hopefully, LSS doesn't take notes because last time they took notes, I asked LSS if they could make Prism better, uh, make Runeblade better. So, this was before, <laughs> before Monarch released. So, this is a bit of a backfire. Um, main thing You're I want to see. 
Yeah. You did this, Eugen. You did this to us. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Sorry about Chain. My bad. <laughs> Viserai, Skeleta, come on, man. Okay, sorry about Skeleta and sorry about Sonata. <laughs> okay, you're um, forgiven. So main thing I want to see. Um, I think a lot of the less competitive players are noticing that it's difficult to play the game at a casual level uh, because you have most of the players are competitive, competitively minded. So I want to see what they do with their PVE system. I, having played around with possible PVE systems in the past with, with Flesh and Blood, I want to see. I'm pretty cautious to as to how they pull it off. But if they do manage to pull it off, and if the gameplay is even a fraction of as as fun as a game like Arkham Horror LCG can be, I think that would be a massive success for the game. And while I don't think it'll help revitalize the casual scene, it'll definitely give alternative modes of play that feel interesting. We're at the point in the game where a lot of other card games are going to be starting to explore alternative modes, whether it's different formats or if it's different modes entirely. And I want to see what they do. Uh, I don't think Blitz is enough. I think I don't think even think Commoner is enough. I think Commoner is a great start, but I just want to see more casual formats. Um, so there's that. In terms of product lineup, um, I want to see. Okay, so this is this is my 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 crackpot hope, which is. I want to see new classes introduced via pre-constructed decks. If you're going to introduce a class like Illusionist in Monarch, have a separate deck that's pre-constructed that has a new hero that's a base Illusionist with a bunch of Illusionist cards that are three ofs, and have that work as the base where Illusionist players can pick up the deck as well as buy the new set to um, kickstart and keep classes up to parity with the existing classes. I think that would be exciting to see new con classic constructed heroes introduced via pre-constructed decks. And I think it has the potential to be a lot of fun and a way to keep interest in the game afloat and keep metagames fresh if they stagger the releases between uh, between formats instead of you know using bands to shake up the format. Hmm. That's interesting. I just was thinking the other day, actually, like, what would a non-talented illusionist look like? Like is there even a card pool for that? Like, are you then running like veiled intentions? Yeah, there's a distinct gameplay for yeah, there's a distinct gameplay for illusionists that they've been building up, which is uh, stuff that gives you stuff when they pop and stuff that wants to be popped, right? Which it with like veiled intentions and all the like coalescence mirage. Yeah. So I think they're building up for a hero, but I don't want that hero to be introduced via a supplemental set. I want that hero to be introduced with a bunch of cards that are dedicated for it, and that way. You're not required to. Uh, new players can just pick up the deck and have a good head start into an interesting class, and they don't have to dedicate that to worry about limited or worry about it introducing with another hero or making it mesh with an existing limited format. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting. I mean, uh, I think that's definitely where we're like lacking a little bit is that the pre con blitz decks are not really cutting it you know well they're not beginner friendly right yeah you know yeah i think and, the fi deck is pretty beginner friendly but they started oh, yeah. including complexity ratings with the new uprising decks that i think is great oh, mostly nice. because i did it as well but um <laughs> but i think they need to put that, put that on the front of the deck and they need to have a wider selection so more pre-con decks I think that, I think that's an easy way to expand, and they've already have the printing product technology for it, so might as well just go crazy for it. I do agree with you that I hope the PVE system is excellent because then you can really like the role play appeal of this game. You could like really appreciate that because it's really yeah. fun to role play your hero and that flavor. But then mm -hmm. after like Azalea gets crunched by starvo for the 30th time it just like loses some of its you know exactly <laughs> some of and its uh appeal um, the biggest concern i have with a pve system is that you have so many classes that are designed around hindering the opponent especially azalea 
that I struggled to think of a good AI based system that would uh, force those would, would have the same like ranger appeal where you're making them, you know, do stuff they don't want to because, you know, they were hindered. Oh, that's interesting. Like how is red in the ledger not broken against the boss or <laughs> yeah, whatever. assuming they can do like four actions per turn, you can yeah. just repeat red and ledger, or even if it's something like, how do you make your opponent choose between paying resources or discarding a card? Right. Right. Either, either you have that entire class of cards just not function in PV PVE, or you do some weird system where you can just blanket, apply it to a bunch of cards in the future. Or disruptive effects. I don't know. Or flip a coin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Like, so uh, there's this game, this deck building game, um, Shards of Infinity. And one of their expansions was uh, a PVE expansion. And I was like really unsure how that was going to work because it's already, it's by the same people who made Ascension, um, mm -hmm. Stoneblade Entertainment uh justin whatever sorry i'm blanking on his last name um mm -hmm. is the game designer and it's like a competitive or like head-to-head -head deck building game and so i was like well then how are you going to be able to like cooperate versus like a boss and that sort of thing and they actually did it uh rather cleanly uh for like how stuff interacts with the boss deck that i was pretty surprised so um i don't need to get into the minutia of how that worked but um gives me hope for what the pve system will wind up being for yeah. flesh and blood anyway so yeah absolutely i'm just I a podcaster wanna... not a game designer so <laughs> i wanted to say oliver i also agree with you in terms of uh like i know lss is a very small company but the game is like fairly large now and i don't think there's any reason they can't out outsource things like um you know tournament organization or like testing you know i don't think there's any reason they can't have a bigger testing team um mm -hmm. just to make the game yeah you know i mean it's an excellent game as is for sure but like i feel like there's no reason to not have like more testers for each yeah. set you know just to smooth it out yeah i think the reason why they don't want to do it is because the testers are not allowed to can be in competitive tournaments if they do test mm -hmm. and a lot of the high level people high level players that are available to test obviously want to compete instead of test right. and just watch on the sidelines yeah yeah unlike yeah. me <laughs> i mean it makes a lot of sense i mean yeah, I mean, my hope for the future is that the OP system is uh, restructured a little bit, just in terms of like the calendar year where mm -hmm. we get uh, like the battle hardens, if that's now going to be a thing, like those spread out a bit more throughout yeah. the year and that they don't have to so much uh correlate to set releases and that sort of thing whereas like maybe callings can correlate with the big uh set releases and hopefully that like the uh pq and rtn season is like one week longer each like four weeks feels kind of like really really fast and is I find difficult to find time in like my regular adult life to make the time for when those things like come around and feel like I've participated in the season like enough. You know what I mean? That makes sense. Yeah, totally. Like it's just a uh, it's just really hard for a lot of people to keep a steady commitment to the OP season, especially as people get older. And start having kids and start you know having other responsibilities uh unlike yeah. us so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i yeah, mean just... i don't know if you did if it did go five six weeks then if you do have other commitments it's easier to kind of maybe fit in your one road to nats or whatever you yeah. know whereas if like you just happen to be somewhere else for a whole month you like 
miss out on an entire competitive season that then you yeah. have like no chance to continue to participate in. So, cause your, mm-hmm. your LGS could be running draft armories or blitz armories or sealed armories or UPF or whatever, you know, so you might not even get to participate in what happens in the new set. So that's kind of my hope anyway for next year. Yeah. All right. So we do have some questions from our listeners, but we have kind of actually covered uh, a few of them already in the main topic of the pod. But I did want to ask you uh, your new friend Levi's question. He has two questions. So he wants to know how you use your testing time most effectively and also what is the best place for vegetarian food in your area? Ooh. He's actually not a new friend. We, I, I played him in Vegas, the, uh, the world premiere of Tales. I played him in a side event, and that's how we. But he uh, didn't talk to you after that, did he? No, but you just played him once, and he's your friend now. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's <laughs> awesome. a friend. Yeah, but okay, yeah, we actually know each friend. other for a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we talked about uh, Lexi uh, during that match, and um, actually, yeah, I don't know. We've always. I guess we were always on friendly terms. If we ever talked to each other in between that. So once. <laughs> yeah. One <time. laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, how to use the testing time most effectively. Uh, I just play fast, so I guess play more games. So um, I'll tell you how to use his testing time more effectively or how he uses his testing time effectively. He during work, he plays games. No, no. I, yes. <laughs> so. Unlike other people who actually have jobs, he during his supposed work hours, he I see him relatively frequently on Discord, just like playing some games with some other people. So it's actually not that often. <laughs> awesome. That's how you do it. The the other the other secret, I think, is record as many games as you can. Uh that's honestly what we what Oliver does at this point, yeah. which is just if he if he's playing a casual game with somebody and they're okay with being recorded. He just records it because it's free content and it lets him review it after the fact when he's like not playing games to review his misplays and, you know, do all that. Yeah. Do you actually and review them with a critical eye to like get better? Yeah. So when I was first playing Prism, uh, I actually watched those games a lot just to see what are the, what are the different lines of play that I could have done. I will probably start doing that for Icelander because there are so many lines that I've missed and I don't want to make the other person wait for me to figure out the line. So sometimes I just go back and be like, oh, I should have done this or this. And actually a lot of my testing is just like playing stuff in my head, trying to figure out what cards I want to do or <laughs> use. So I always like deck build while I'm like on the toilet or in the shower. So <laughs> that's like his entire life is flesh and blood. <laughs> yeah. That is the most effective use of testing yeah. is outside of testing. And one last thing, which I guess most people cannot do is he outsources a lot of his misplay analysis to the comment section where the comment section, mm-hmm. and I think at this point it's expected of the comment section to point out his misplays. So he just go back and be like, Oh, thanks. Free advice. Yeah. Hmm, smart. Nice. Great. Try. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't really recorded it. Hardly any of my games. Um, usually I have like a pretty good conversation with my opponent afterwards or just like kind of out loud at them, (laughs) which Mm -hmm. I don't know how much they appreciate that, but, um, that's interesting. Maybe I'll start, uh, filming my games, especially for my Icelander games. Cause you're right. Like it's, it's hard to know because your, your choice will affect your next like three or four turns and you're unsure of how that's going to play out. So. Interesting. And what about vegetarian food in your area? Um, let's see. So I used to, I was vegetarian back in the day. Uh, my parents really love this restaurant called Loving Hut. Yeah, it's, that's quite good. Yeah, that's a really popular vegetarian restaurant that's popped up in a couple of malls. Um, and then also I would just recommend any Indian food place. They always have really good vegetarian options. Yeah, our area has a lot of South Indian food, uh, which is a vegetarian cuisine. Uh, so if you want South Indian food, it's pretty spicy, but it's pretty good. Uh, and it's almost all vegetarian stuff. Uh, you can check out some of the numerous South Indian, South Indian restaurants. 
in the area. Loving Cut, I believe, is a Korean slash Asian based place. I, I think it's that Korean. Was, I always thought it was Chinese and Vietnamese. Oh, I think it's Korean because they they have the <laughs> clay pots. Um, but yeah, so Loving Cut is a Pan Asian <laughs> uh, restaurant, and uh, when to all prospective people who are planning on getting here for uh, for worlds. I highly recommend that if you are a vegetarian or if you're just interested in having some a vegetarian meal, go to one of the numerous Indian or Asian uh, places and they'll probably have some good vegetarian food there. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, that's very pertinent information actually coming up here. Yeah. And take yeah, your cards to... into the shower with you. Get them all sudsy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, Yindurai looks like it needs a shower, so... <laughs> Better hook it up. Necrio. Necrio, actually. Oh, yeah. Hella ashy. Well, they just need lotion, actually. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Moisturize. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so Thor Mike asks, what started the hoodie? So this is for you, Oliver, because you have your famous purple hoodie you wear. Is it your uh, lucky jersey? Just general freshness? Answer, answer those questions for us, yeah. please. Uh, so in short, it's purple, which is my favorite color, and it's comfy. The long answer is uh, I'm the youngest of three brothers, and my older brother used to wear the, uh, the same jacket. And when he went to college, he stopped using it and just gave it to me. And I pretty much just wore it throughout high school. Yeah, it hasn't it hasn't been washed since. I this that's <laughs> actually the third jacket I have. Yeah, awesome. uh, it's Wait, yeah, it's from that, a brand. It's yeah, the it's same good. purple hoodie. Uh, no, it's the same like design so i uh, bought three I of those i've uh, gotten three of those throughout my uh life so far and it's from american apparel hmm. but they went out of business so don't they don't make that color anymore i did buy another hoodie from them very recently but it's not the same color hmm. but yeah are you gonna bust that out during your flesh and blood games or uh i have i brought it to uh, i wore it at our road nets it's a darker purple oh uh, okay yeah not yeah. the not the correct shade of purple. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> and now we ha we have a joke. We have a running joke that the power is in the hoodie because I've worn just my regular jackets to events and I did really poorly. So I, at the calling, I just wore a regular members only jacket and it was, I went like a one in three. I went to a uh, ProQuest with that uh, with a members only jacket and I went like one in four. So the power's on the hoodie. I'm just the through, through the that crash. Yeah. <laughs> he is the meat puppet being puppeted by the purple hoodie, which is the true source of power. Yeah. <laughs> well, now the prices of purple American apparel hoodies on eBay have uh, spiked. So yeah, hurry up and get them, everybody. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, Isaac, unless you have another question, I think it's time for our signature segments. Unless Yichin or Oliver, you want to ask us anything or or anything like that. Uh. Yeah, honestly, we talked about a lot of stuff, so I'm good with asking, asking no questions. Same. Yeah, <laughs> we, we we covered a lot. I, in I our... apologize. We don't. I apologize. We don't have any questions pre pre prepared for you guys. So yeah, that's because we heard all the good. questions in a previous collab. <laughs> oh yeah, that's our job this time around. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. All right, pick, pass, pray, Taylor. All right, so we got a draft scenario. I'm going to give you guys three cards. You're going to tell me which one you are going to pick, pass, and then pray comes back around. Are there any questions or concerns before we begin? Nope. nope. I think we're ready. Okay, Yichin, you will get first crack at this complex puzzle I've come up with. So... And then, okay. and then we'll go to Oliver and then Isaac and, and finish on me and I'll tell you all how it's done. Okay, so first card up is Blue Ember Moss Cinepie. Okay. It pitches for three, costs two, defense for three, attacks for six, is yep. a Draconic Illusionist attack action. It has Phantasm and it reads, when Ember Moss Cinepie is destroyed, create an Ash Token. So that is the first card. Our second card is red brothers in arms pitches for one cost two defends for two attacks for six and is a generic attack action and it reads 
When you defend with brothers in arms, you may pay one resource. If you do, it gains plus two defense. On both sides of the battlefield, brotherhood is a catalyst of courage, conviction, and most importantly, hope. Our third... Yeah, that is actually pretty good flavor text. Our third and final card is Rise Up. It is red, so it pitches for one, costs one, defends for three, attacks for three, is a draconic attack action, and it is also a Dromai or Phi specialization with Rupture. If Rise Up is played as Chain Link 4 or higher, it has Dominate and plus X attack where X is twice the number of Phoenix Flames you control. So, Yichin, which one are you going to pick, pass, and pray comes back around? Okay, this is easy for me. Uh, pick Brothers and Irons Red. Uh, pass, uh, rise up. Pray for Evermall Senpai. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's the right order. You pick the Brothers and Arms because, uh, assuming this is Uprising Draft, this is a card that you are hoping will wheel because it directly counters the other card that you're that you're uh, or it, it it directly counters the card you're hoping to wheel right so if it right. doesn't wheel then you're good right because you can counter that card um i'm personally not a big fan of fight so i will pass the the red hot i think rise as up. a card itself yeah r- sorry r- rise up i think as a card itself the power level isn't super high especially if i'm gonna be picking up red brothers in arms uh because that's you know one card that absolutely doesn't work with it so yeah i think that's about right um and then if amber mall senapai comes back around to me that's great because now i can play uh, play dromai and i don't have to worry about one popper in the pool sweet oliver you can just repeat what each said <laughs> but <laughs> Uh, yeah, it is. I would choose Red Brothers in Arms um, since it's a popper. Uh, Rise Up is actually really poor in both Limited and CC, as far as I can tell. So I would never pick that in a draft. And then I would pray Ember Moss Senpai would, roll, uh, would wheel. Because it is a block three. It also pitches for three. And it's still six damage. So it's uh, pretty good. All right. Uh, over to you, Isaac. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, also, the Brothers in Arms, like a two for six is... Uh, that's like not bad in draft or in a limited format. Yeah. You know, like I've I've like run one in an Easlander deck when I didn't have enough cards. I've, you know, it's just like swinging for six is like pretty good when your opponent only has 20 life. So, I mean, it's like primary purpose is a popper, but it like pairs with Quell um on defense and it swings for six it's just like only good stuff it's like a little expensive in five maybe but just yeah very strong card and yeah if blue ember maw wheels you're probably the only or one of like two drum eyes at the table and that's like right where you want to be anyway um if that comes back around or maybe not just like yeah wheeling that card i think is pretty it's not <laughs> There can't be that many dromides, right? And uh, yeah, I agree with you guys. The uh, the rise up is like pretty a pretty poor card, just because there's like no synergy. I mean, if you get two Phoenix Flames out, you can pop Heat Wave to get a bonus there, and then you can play Rise Up one for five. But with Phi, you're just like like planking them. I mean, you could kill them with a Dominate, but odds are it's like. That's that's not really your win condition, right? Your your yeah. win condition is them bleeding out, not <laughs> not getting dominated. Anyway, yeah. that's enough for me. What do you think, Taylor? Uh, I think you guys are all correct. Uh, Brothers in Arms Red is definitely out of these three the first pick for sure. I think I. Well, two things. So I'm a little disappointed in the specializations in this set, mm-hmm. and this is now my platform to state that. Um, <laughs> I thought they, I thought they would be a little bit like better. Like specializations usually are, you know, mm-hmm. like a key component to 
um, somebody's game plan and it, you find it hard to actually cut them. Yeah. Um, but Rise Up has like the added benefit of being a red that blocks for three. So I think in this scenario, I would uh, actually be kind of happy if either of those wield because maybe by the time this Rise Up comes back, I am in like Phi maybe. And the block for threes help you out a lot in the mirror anyway. Um, so kind of a late pick, like pick eight potentially, right? Is when you see that again. Yeah, is uh, I would be happy with that. Yeah. Um, but I also really like the blue Ember Moss Cinepi. I also feel like people are pretty low on the blue Cinepi. So sometimes that doesn't like, I don't know, give you a very good signal. Um, but, you know, you can't pass up a blue that blocks for three and deals six damage. So, yeah, that's absolutely. That's, that's how I that's how I feel about it. Yeah, I want to get in on that train also. What the hell? It's annoying that Droma is a brand new hero and has like zero specializations. You know, <laughs> it's one of the most fun parts. Uh, I do think Eastlander's specialization is very cool and like yeah, appropriately yes. powerful, you know, yeah. in like mm-hmm. certain situations. That's really cool. But yeah, the the Draconic ones are just kind of garbage, especially for Dromai when they reference Phoenix Flames. You know, you're just like... <laughs> what <laughs> anyway sorry i just you triggered me so, but now i'm done <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's the most fun part you know red the ledger <laughs> <laughs> i mean i guess nobody plays arc knight ascendancy anymore that card is uh unplayable so yeah, my favorite be, card be isn't become no yeah become is the other specialization yeah, yeah. All, all the tutors are relatively playable other than like Sand Sketch Plan. Sand Sketch Plan is still used. It's still blocked for three. Yeah. Okay. What, else, what yeah. isn't played? Uh, yeah, I guess whatever. Uh, <laughs> does, does Dash run both of her specializations? Uh, yes. Tech Load Core and Spark of Genius. Spark of yeah. Genius, yeah. yeah. Light it up is them, by the way. not often played. <laughs> what is not? Light it up. Oh, yeah. True. I or forced that into I, it. Yeah. Ice Storm? Is that also a specialization that no. is not played? No, it's just both. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Or Double fuse with both. Yeah. Oh, right. That's the one that fuses for both and nobody plays. Yeah. Failure. Um, <clears throat> board game from the closet, Isaac. Yep. Here at the Attack Action Podcast, we like many games, card games, board games, and uh everything under the sun. So sometimes we like to share one of those games with you guys in hopes that you will enjoy it as well. Today's board game from the closet is uh, Oliver and Yichin's board game. You can mention Scrap. I'll mention something else. I can do Kenny's pick if he was here, which would be Scrap. And then I'll do my own pick. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show for Kenny a little bit. Uh, if he's been working on his own board game called Scrap, and it's like a, it's an area control game where the main mechanic is programming your actions. It's a programming cool. Cool. Uh, programming queue. And then you also have um, bots that you create and try and control some areas to get sec- extra bonuses. And there's a, a lot of hand management involved where you can um, uh, kind of deck build. You level up some skills, you get new cards, you kind of use those cards to power up other cards or you can play them as well. And uh, yeah, it's a very fun, asymmetric area control, hand management, all those adjectives for game. And uh, he's been working on it for like the past two plus years. And I've been play testing with him for a year and a half e- easily. Oh, oh, probably cool. more. Yeah. And I'm he's hoping to get it out by... A Kickstarter out by like uh, October ish. So yeah. the game's awesome. basically mostly done. He's just getting using Kickstarter for the funds, that's out, the printing yeah. funds essentially. Yeah. That's really yeah. Cool. awesome. Maybe. Yeah. What a great yeah. pitch. Yeah, yeah. Those are all of my favorite mechanics area control, programming, hand management. Those like, that's all my stuff. So that's great. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. We'll have to uh, check back in and announce when it comes out. 
Yeah, I'll, we'll I'll, I'll let you guys shout know. out. Awesome. Yeah, uh, it might not be Kickstarter. He's probably looking at, at some other crowdfunding sites, but Game Found probably. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so what's your what's your pick? All right, so my pick would be the Search for Planet X. It's a deduction game where you're trying to find celestial bodies in the sky. You can kind of think about it as Sudoku, but uh, not with numbers. It's more with, with celestial bodies. And it's an app-based, uh, app-assisted game. Mm-hmm. And you're just rotating around the sky, searching the skies for certain bodies and patterns, and then um, trying to deduce where planet X is based on what you have found in the sky. It's a oh, uh, cool. Yeah, it's a it's a very casual game, but it's also very um, thought provoking and very deep. If uh, you um, what is it? How should I put this? It tickles the same it tickles the same neurons that a good game of like Sudoku does, where you're just trying to like figure out stuff by process of elimination mm-hmm. or other like logic rules. Uh, and you're trying to figure out figure it out before your opponents do. Yeah. So. Yep. Sweet. I love it. Great. What about you, Yichen? Ooh. Uh, I can do a lot of stuff, but I think um, the one game that I can I want to recommend to everybody. It's not a board game, technically. It's a living card game. It's Arkham Horror LCG. I mentioned this earlier in the podcast, but it's one of my favorite card games. Mostly, mostly because uh, it's a PVE card game where you and up to four other, or three other players um, are tackling a specific scenario, and the scenarios are usually um, referencing or feel they feel like old horror movies where mm-hmm. you're trying to outrace something or you're trying to like discover some secret. So it's a very interesting and varied board game. It has a lot of deck building fun where you can where there's multiple personalities and characters to build around, and We've gone through, I think, like three, four campaigns right now, with plenty. with friends. Yeah, yeah, plenty of campaigns. Plenty, of, plenty of campaigns. There are like eight scenarios each, so basically that's thirty two plus sessions, and uh, the game doesn't get old because it is so well designed that the, the main system can apply to so many different scenarios that there is a plethora of content for it and a plethora of fan content for it. That if you enjoy the game you will never run out of content to play, essentially. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but basically it's a adventure game, essentially, uh, where you are going around a certain uh, setting and you're investigating certain certain places to get, like, you know, to advance the objective, or you're dealing with monsters and dealing with enemies to either, like, you know, beat back the horrors of the night and so on and so forth. So... Uh, good fun all around. Highly recommend it. Uh, if you get the chance, you can just pick up a core set. So, yeah, yeah. Me and Isaac uh, are well. I'm way familiar with it, and me and Isaac have an open campaign going on right now of the Circle Undone. Currently, oh, same yeah, that's yeah, where, that's, that's where, where we are. are. Yeah. Oh okay, hell cool. yeah, Thanks. yeah. I uh, one of my big things I did as an unemployed, depressed person during lockdown was solo all of the. Arkham Horror uh, campaigns I had previously had. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that was a whole new experience for sure. But yeah, I love Arkham Horror. It's really great. Who's your favorite investigator? If you have. Uh, yeah, my favorite right now is uh, Bob, the salesperson. Uh, I'm playing him right now for Circle and Denny. It's great fun. Uh, nice. He's mostly a support character, right? He just sells items to players. Um, Oliver, what's your favorite? Uh, the waitress, Agnes. So oh, nice. Yeah. But there's also the investigator I'm playing now, which reduces the um, the randomness. Yeah, yeah. Draw. Jacqueline Fine. Yeah. Jacqueline Fine is also really fun. I like to play a lot of Mystic. Hmm. Cool. He plays Mystic. I play, I usually play Seeker, but I've been playing uh, Survivor this time around. So it's a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah. yeah I I think... re- Go ahead, Isaac. I was just going to say, you really like fall in love with your character and deck in that game also yes as you kind of like build it across uh multiple adventures and well, you know learn I mean, you get like and penalties and stuff that are like that are mm-hmm. things that happen to you during the scenario so it's got its own personal history to you so you have a bit of ownership for the deck mm-hmm. as well 
It's like, oh, yeah. this this is the deck that brought me through these campaigns and stuff like that. Yeah, I I love it. It's it's got a ton of flavor, um, and that's one of the things that draws it to me. I think my two favorite investigators would have to be William York, the Grave Digger, because yeah. you can build this like really fun recursion deck where you like stab monsters and then rifle through their body and get your knife back and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I really liked, ooh, who's the artist? Sophia Rousseau. Yo, oh, yeah, think. that cycles her hand every turn. Yeah, she like can play extra events. Like she copies extra events you've played or something oh, that one. Yeah, yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a great time with with her as well. So great picks. Love it. Yeah. Great game. Sweet. Uh, okay. Well, if we don't have anything else, I would like to thank both of you for coming on. Uh, you know, it's been an excellent podcast this time. And I, I really love talking to both of you. So feel free to plug any of your socials or anything you have upcoming or whatever you want to do. This is your time to <laughs> self promote. Oh, you want to self promote? Uh, no, I hate social media. That's why there's, we don't have one. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, you can find us on YouTube, smash that like button, click the bell. Make sure to subscribe to AAP and us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having us, guys. Thanks for yeah. having us. Taylor yeah. and Isaac. <laughs> we're really bad at this self-promotion thing. Yeah. Totally. Can I direct all of my uh, Oliver questions as well, just to you, Yichin? Are you on yeah, Twitter? I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer for it. Uh, I am on Twitter, but I'm a lurker, so I, I don't actually engage with anything. And I don't intend to change that anytime soon. So. <laughs> you can find me on Discord. You can find me on Reddit. I guess. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's where I post all my stuff. Cool. Sweet. Well, yeah, again, thanks guys. Uh, I had a blast this, this whole episode. It was great. And I look forward yeah. to doing more with you as yeah. well. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Oh yeah. Go check out this rounds on me. If you guys haven't watched that, mm-hmm. we'll say that here at the very end. Oh yeah. Yes. Everybody definitely heard that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On our two hour episode. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm going to hit stop now. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at the Attack Action Podcast. On Twitter, we are at Battle Bro Taylor and at Battle Bro Isaac. Shoot us an email, the Attack Action Podcast at gmail.com. If you would like to support us, like and subscribe. Shop for singles using our affiliate link or support our Patreon for as little as $4 per month.